Hey everyone, welcome to Fusion. Thanks for being with us this morning. Remember this Tuesday evening, January 15th, we're having men's meeting together. You don't want to miss it. We always get to the heart of what it means to be a man and to be Christ-like. That's this Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m., January 15th. Next Sunday, January 20th, the junior youth will be meeting at Albert and Shirley Penner's home again at 3 o'clock. On Saturday, January 26th, Belize Camping Experience is hosting their Connect Day at Countryside Park. They've invited youth from around the area to come and do service projects with them, play volleyball and other games together, and have dinner together at the end of the day. It lasts from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock p.m. That's January 26th. Hope for Life would like to thank everybody at Fusion for their continued encouragement and support throughout 2018. Fusion has provided Hope for Life with the funds for the ceiling for their new classroom, as well as 40 chairs, baby wipes and diapers, and continued monthly support. It's so appreciated. Did you know that abortion claimed 41.9 million lives worldwide in 2018? Over five times as many as cancer. Hope for Life has helped women choose life when the world around them is telling them to end it through abortion. They've been able to help 195 women this year with over 1,500 visits to the center. Thank you, Fusion, for stepping up. You're making a difference in the world. Thanks for joining us today. Enjoy the service. I was standing there, and this come to my heart. David never knew he was going to be king until the day the word of the Lord showed up. A shepherd out in the field with no idea of what was coming until God spoke through his prophet. And I say that this morning because I wonder how many of us are sitting here today and we have no idea what the next word of God spoken to our heart is going to do for the rest of our life. Can you say amen? One spoken word. Paul was killing Christians and working harder than anybody for his religion until the light come on. And he found Jesus. And I share that this morning because I... It's not because it's a part of my message because I feel a stirring of the Holy Spirit and I believe that the Spirit of God wants to speak to each and every one of us. Not just this morning. Oh, I believe He's going to speak this morning. But it's not just this morning. It's every day of our life, the Spirit of the living God wants a relationship with us where He speaks to us one-on-one, -on -one, day after day after day, revealing not only the glory of who He is, but the glory of who He's causing you to be what He's calling you to, what He's bringing you to. Can you say amen? Look at somebody and say it's coming like never before. Come on, that was kind of weak. Say it's coming like never before. I'm going to read you this verse of Scripture in Acts chapter 4. I wasn't ready to dismiss them, but it's okay. I wanted the teachers to hear this. Not always. Always is a big word. How many knows always is a big word? Does anybody always do something? Even the things we try to always do, we never quite manage to always do it. Am I right? I, in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 1 is we're going to start the message in a minute. But, but I'm trying to prepare our hearts because I feel like the Lord is... It's just awesome and amazing and, and, and wants to do great things. But in, in the book of Acts chapter 4, the disciples have been arrested for preaching Jesus. And in the middle of their persecution, they begin to pray. And um, I'm just going to jump down to the, towards the bottom. He says, uh, For of the truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So what he's saying here is the things that they did to Jesus was appointed to be done. Now you got to get a hold of that because it's real easy to think that, that God isn't the one who appointed this. God appointed Pilate and Herod and the Jews and the Gentiles that were there that day to crucify him. And it's important that you understand that it was God's plan to crucify him, not man's plan to crucify him. Because if you don't understand that, then we get a, 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 a wrong picture 
of what God sometimes does in our life, we think any bad thing or any struggle or any conflict or any trial that comes along must, must, must just be the enemy. And so we're being defeated and, and now we're asking God to come and bring us victory. But so oftentimes the greatest victories in your life came because God was appointed a time for you to go through some things even when you don't understand it. For us to be saved, somebody had to die. But I challenge you that there are things in your life that will have to die before you can go on into a more abundant life than where you are right now. And so sometimes God does appoint some things in our life for us to go through, not to kill you, but to kill the things in your life that need to die. Can you say amen? Stop giving the devil credit for everything. We, we sang that song, and you hear preachers preach that sermon. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Then why are people running around talking about how bad the devil is? Why are you focused on him when, when the one in you is greater than him? Why don't you focus on that? I'm going to preach this morning. I am not even got to my sermon yet, but I'm going to preach this morning. Can you come on? Amen, somebody. He goes on, he says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants, somebody say servants. How many realize he quit talking about Jesus now? When he starts talking about the servants, he's not talking about Jesus. Jesus did what Jesus did. Jesus opened the door. He paid the price. The blood was shed. Now he's not talking about Jesus anymore. Look at somebody and say, you're the servant. Now unto thy servants... that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and there were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with Boldness. Somebody say boldness. Come on, be bold and say boldness. I, I, I want to challenge you with this this morning. I want to stretch the... Praise the Lord. I want to stretch the confines of your mind and the limitations that we sometimes put because... I, I, we, we live in a Christian world where we're in the middle of the road God wants you to be, but both sides are a ditch. And on this side of the ditch, um, people are, 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 are believing and, and even saying that, 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 that there's not signs and there's not wonders. And, 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 and if you get involved in those things, you're just way off and you're evil. And then you have the other sign over here where we're all about signs and wonders. And if we're not seeing signs and wonders all the time, then it's not really a church and the power of God isn't there. Like God is just going to sit around and do signs and wonders all day. He ain't got nothing better to do. Like Signing Wonders is God's video games. Woo-hoo! Do, 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 do. It wasn't Signs and Wonders when he was dying. Right? It wasn't Signs and Wonders when he was out in the wilderness fasting and praying for 40 days. Come on, somebody. But yet in the midst of Jesus' life, in the midst of his walking with God and in his obedience, signs and wonders were happening. I think we need to come to that place in the road where we say, you know, my life isn't about signs and wonders. It's about Jesus. But if I live my life for him, I can expect to see God move heaven and earth. I can expect God to shine the light and shatter the darkness and cause the, 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 the deaf to hear and the blind to see. Come on, somebody. I think that we need to quit trying to limit what God can do and just release God to be God. And in the boldness of God, speak his word forth and let his word accomplish whatever God wants to do today. Can I get some spirit-filled people to say amen? amen. Turn with me to the book of Matthew. I wonder what God has in store for you today. I'm not talking about my message. I know kind of an idea what my message is going to be. But I wonder what the Holy Spirit of God wants to say to you. What he wants to reveal to you about you and about him. And about what he wants to do with you and in you and through you and by you. Come on, somebody. We didn't just come here to have church. We don't just come to clap our hands and sing a little bit and listen to a sermon and go home. We come to encounter the living presence of God Almighty and be changed forever by him. 
That might, that might look miraculous today, and it might not look miraculous today. But it doesn't always look miraculous when God is doing great things inside of you. Sometimes the things that He's doing in you, nobody else... Anybody ever get a revelation from God and it's so exciting and you go to share it with somebody and they don't really seem to get it? Am I the only one that's ever done that? Four people have the boldness we talked about to raise their hand. I, I'm... <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. Pray for me, Anita. I'm going to get in trouble. Your personality is the product of many things. The things that you have gone through. Both the lies and the truths that you have believed about yourself and about God and about how things work. It is both your gifting and calling as well as your, your flaws, your mistakes, and your sufferings. All of these things come together to make up your personality. Now, it's great when you're doing leadership training to understand personalities because when you learn and understand personalities, it helps you understand how to deal with people on their level. Here's the problem, though. We have taken these concepts of personalities and we've used them to try to define what's God and what's not, and that's wrong. Because God did not create anybody to not have the boldness of the Holy Spirit to speak truth when it's time to speak truth. We all are overcoming our personalities in order to become what God has called us to be. All of us are overcome. The caloric personality types have to overcome their personality to be meek and humble and gentle and kind to people when they need it. The very sanguine, laid-back people, they have to overcome their personalities to be bold and strong when God commands it. So, when I say that they were praying for boldness, I want you to understand, God called you to have great courage. Look at somebody say, great courage. Regardless of your personality type. Regardless of your background. Regardless of what your, your culture says is proper and is not proper. Do you realize that all through the Bible you see people obeying God and throwing culture aside to do things their culture said was wrong? To celebrate what God wanted to do that day. I, I'm, I, I was born and raised in America, and, and I'll be honest with you. We Americans, we have a little fault. We, we do. We think the way we do it is the right way to do it for everybody. And at some point, if you're going to move to a foreign country and live there, you're going to have to accept the fact that that's a lie. And if you're raised in the Mennonite community, guess what? There's a few there too. And if you were, if you were raised in a, in a Spanish culture, guess what? There's a few there too. And if you're raised in Canada, although you're probably a lot more polite than the rest of us, there's some there too. Can you say amen? You see, we're not right because of who we are. We're only right when we obey what he says. He is the one who's right. Matthew 1 and verse 18. I know I'm, I'm, I'm running around here and doing all this, trying to set this up. But Matthew 1 and verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. How many know the word betrothed means like today we would say engaged, right? Or promised to. How many realize that when you get engaged? Raise your hand if you've ever been engaged. Come on, this is your chance. There we go. Congratulations, by the way, Kenrick. I just went blank, sorry. <laughs> How many knows it means you have a plan? Right? You, you got engaged because you have a, a plan to get married. Come on. Right? How many knows we as people make plans for a lot of things? And the problem is that when our plans aren't working out the way that we think they ought to be, then either God is doing something wrong, or Satan is intervening, or something can't be right because our plans aren't coming out the way we had planned them to be. Never does it ever occur to some of us that the problem wasn't God, or even Satan, that it's that we're, we have bad plans. And the only thing sometimes that makes a plan bad is the fact that it's not God's. 
And our ability to follow God will be directly tied to your ability to let go of your plans when you discover they're not His. Your ability to see when it's not God but you and to let it go and to take up. I mean, David was a good shepherd, man. He killed a lion. He killed a bear. I mean, how many years going to keep some sheep and then... I'm not talking about rifles and shotguns either. How many, how many of you, if you was a young boy in the field watching the sheep for your dad and a lion show up, aren't going to run to the house? Daddy! I'm out. I was to be honest with you. You don't have to be a big lion. I'm out. Don't give me no leather thong and a, and a rock. I don't know what to do with that. You give me 20 stones, I'll probably miss every one. I'm not prepared for that kind of a fight. Can you say amen? And yet... David was so dedicated and committed to playing his role in the family. Man, <laughs> I can tell you I'm going to get in trouble. I wish some more of us would just be dedicated to playing our role in the family the way David can. I mean, he doesn't even know he's going to be king. He's fully committed when it's just being a shepherd. We sometimes can't commit to the little things. How do we expect God to call us to be a king when we can't? Well, I'll leave it alone. Because I'll get sidetracked. He's so committed to being the shepherd that he kills the lion and he kills the bear just with a rock and a piece of leather. And then God calls him to be king. And then he gets put in this position to defend the entire nation, to represent God and his nation before the Philistines and before, before the enemies and, and even before God's own people to declare that God is God and he is greater than any giant and that God in us can overcome any obstacle. And with the same tools that made him a great shepherd, he became a great warrior. The same piece of leather and the same rocks, roughly. You, you, you see, when we get a little successful in being a shepherd, then all of a sudden our plans are all in place and set, and this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I'm going to be, and I'm good at this. And about the time that you start planning on who you are, God shows up and disrupts your plans right you see it says they were they were betrothed to joseph she was betrothed to joseph before they came together she was found to be with child from the holy spirit and her husband joseph being a just man and unwilling to put her uh, to shame resolved to divorce her quietly but as he considered these things behold the angel of the lord appeared to him in a dream saying joseph somebody say a dream Appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had already spoken by the prophets. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel commanded him, and he took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Uh, there's no way I'm going to finish what I want to do today, but I'm going to work on it for a few minutes, okay? Do you understand that Mary and Joseph had a plan? They were betrothed. I'm sure they were dreaming about the future. They were predicting and planning, and, 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 and their culture had things in place. They, they, they had some idea of where they were going to live and who they were going to live with and some idea of where they were going to work and how they were going to make money and how they were going to live, how they were going to exist. They were planning their future out in a way that was acceptable to all of them around them. And in the middle of their plans, we discover that God has a dream. And God's dream shows up and disrupts their plan. You see, the angel appears to Mary and tells her she's going to have a child. And she says, according to thy word, be it unto me. And she gets uh, pregnant outside of marriage without having any type of, of carnal relationships. Now, I mean, this is an unbelievable thing. Nobody around you is going to believe this. You don't believe me. Just show up and try it. Just show up at church one day and say, hey, I'm, I got knocked up and it's God. I'm not going to believe you. Nobody's going to believe you. 
It amazes me how many times people show up with things and they think everybody's going to believe them and then they're surprised when they don't. You see, the problem is it doesn't matter if anybody believes you or not. Either it's God or it isn't. We as humans spend so much time trying to convince people it's God when it is or convince people it's God when it ain't. Like once everybody accepts it, then it's okay. Forget it. There's only one person that's got to accept it, Jesus Christ. When it's God, it's God, and nobody else should be able to drag you away from it. So Mary says, yes, Lord. I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. I can't imagine what this is going to be like. Everybody's going to hate me, reject me, think I'm crazy, think I'm lying. It's possibly, I could, at this time, it was still a stonable offense. They could stone me to death. But I'm still going to accept this is the plan of God and do what God says to do. And I'm going to bear this child. And he's going to be this great deliverer of the world, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And then she has to go tell Joseph. Look, I know we've been engaged, and, and, and we have this future planned out, and, 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 and I know you'll, I'm supposed to be your wife, and you're going to be my husband, and, and you're the only one I want, but um, I'm already going to have a baby. How'd you like to have that conversation? Right? That, when you obey God, you will find yourself in positions you never imagined yourself to be in. It will not always be easy. It will not always be fun. And sometimes it will be downright hard and difficult. Difficulty is not the determination as to whether or not it's God. I've heard people say, well, it sure is hard. Maybe it's not God. No, it probably is God if it's hard. I don't read anywhere in the scripture where somebody had it easy and it was God. Well, you know, God come to my life and everything was smooth sailing from then on. No. When God comes into your life, He signs you up for battle, man. It's time for war. The biggest warfare you're going to fight is right in here. So she tells Joseph, and Joseph comes up with the plan. You know, he's a good guy. He's hurt. This is, this is a bad deal. His plans have been destroyed. You know, his, his future wife has been unfaithful. Ain't no way this is a God thing. That's just retarded. You can just imagine, I, mean, I know that's just me saying it, but you can just imagine what you would have felt like if that had been you. Any, any married men in here think you would have handled that well when you're engaged? Your wife comes up and says, hey, I'm pregnant. What? So he comes up with a plan. You know, I don't want to shame her. I don't want to be a bad guy. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to bear the burden of, it already hurts. I don't want to make it worse by bitterness and hatred. And so I'm going to do the good Christian thing. Not that there was a Christian thing yet. And I'm going to put her away quietly. I'm just going to divorce her quietly. I'm not going to have her stoned. I'm not going to embarrass her in front of everybody. And in the middle of his plan, God shows up in a dream and says, this thing that you don't want to do is me. And you're going to do it, whether you want to or not. Am I talking to anybody this morning? This ain't easy. But if it's God, you got to do it anyway. Because God has a plan and a purpose and a dream and a goal for your life. And even though it will not always fit perfectly within the plans of what you want it to be, you will find that God will bring you to a breaking point where you'll finally accept, yes, Lord, I will, even though it's not easy, even though it hurts, even though it costs me a lot, I'll commit to doing it anyway. Because God's dream is bigger than your plans. Moses was in this place of an identity crisis because he's living in the house of the Egyptian Pharaoh. He's called royalty, but yet he knows really he was born as a slave, as a Jew. And in the middle of his crisis and not really understanding, and this is where so many of us are at in Christianity today, we're trapped somewhere between the world and God, somewhere between holy and life, somewhere between what God has called us to and what we want to get out of life. And in the middle of our identity crisis, we get frustrated, we get scared, we get mad, we get hurt, and we wind up hurting people because it's not their fault, but we have never been able to deal with who am I really supposed to be? 
Because I go to church and I feel the Spirit of God and I feel the anointing of the Lord and I want to have that be my life, but yet I leave church and I go back to work and I go back to my family and I I want that truck and I want that house and I want that business and I want that life and I I want that fame and I want that glory and I want that attention and, and I want this and I want that. And somewhere between the struggle of who we know God wants us to be and who we're trying to be, there's a rip inside of our hearts. And that's a very dangerous place to be. Because you'll never be who God wants you to be as long as you're holding on to the world. And you'll never be satisfied in the world as long as God has a part of your heart. So we wind up with a foot on both sides of the fence. If you've ever seen a fail video, men, you know that's a painful place to be. We wind up trying to pretend here and yet make it work there. And you know what happens so often times is we get, in, we get in the middle of life and then life doesn't go like we think it should. The relationship didn't work out the way we thought it would. The business didn't work out the way we thought it would. The, the, the position or the, 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 the entitlement or whatever, something didn't work out the way that we thought that it should. And now we're all tore up and disrupted on the inside. And we're having a hard time trusting God. And we're having a hard time really worshiping and really being committed and really doing what we know we ought to do because this part of our life over here is in such chaos and turmoil. And the reason why it is is because you can't let go of what you didn't get and God is saying if you let that go I'll replace it with something that's me you listening to me when you learn to let go of what you wanted that's when you're going to find out what God really has for you and instead what so often happens is we get in that dangerous position where we can't let go of this and now we're We become bitter and resentful and we hate that person that hurt us. Because you think they cost you something. That man or that woman that left your life, whether they was a friend or whether they were a a, a prospective mate or whether they were your mate. And they decided that you weren't what they wanted and they left. Now you're full of bitterness and resentment and hatred because it's their fault I didn't get what I was supposed to get. And the whole time, God is on the other side saying, look, I have life and life more abundant for you. If you will let that go, you will find out what I have for you. In God, there is no lack of anything. Having all sufficiency in all things at all times, the Bible says. You're grappling after something that no longer exists and missing the fullness of life that God is offering because we can't let go of our plans and discover what God's dream for our life is. And it's as silly. We don't see it because we're emotionally tied to it. You, you, you ever notice that when somebody else is emotionally tied to something, you see so much more clearly than they do? Right? You have that friend that's they've been going through something, you know, sometimes for 20 years. And, and you almost don't even want to hang out because every time you know the conversation is going to wind up on that thing. Right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all are looking at me like a knot on a pickle. Like, mm. You see, when you, when you can't let go, you're still tied to something that's no longer there. And there's an emptiness, there's a longing, there's a dissatisfaction. And God is saying, if you let go of that, I'll show you what I have. And what I have will be so much better than that. We get involved in churches, we get involved in ministries, we get involved with, with Christian people. And because they're Christian people or because we have a high opinion of them, we we put them in a position and we think they're just this amazing and they're great and they're awesome. And then we find out they're human. And then we despise them, not because of who they are, because they weren't who we thought that they were. And we put them in a position that only Jesus Christ has ever been able to live in anyway. And we don't understand why they couldn't be what we wanted them to be. And now we we don't trust people. Sometimes we don't go to churches. We don't ever commit and get reinvolved and really play a role anymore because this one time, guess what? Maybe that was just not where God was calling you to anymore. 
Sometimes God removes people and things and places from your life not to kill you, but to prepare you for the greater thing that's coming for you. And you miss that thing because you're still trying to hold on to some dead thing that God called you out of. And, And then because the enemy is the enemy, then he comes and he says things like, well, everybody else has it. Nobody else is going through that. If it's a relationship, well, their relationship worked, and their relationship worked, and their relationship worked. How come your relationship? Maybe there's something wrong with you. He's right. There is something wrong with you. Look at your neighbor and say, there's something wrong with me. But the blood covers it. You hear me? The blood covers it. Why? Because the enemy is a liar, and because he is deceptive. I say this all the time, but the problem with deceiving spirits is this. Ready? Ready? They're deceiving. That's deep, right? Because they're deceiving, we don't recognize them for what they are oftentimes. And the enemy comes and he brings shame and he brings condemnation and he he brings a feeling of worthlessness and, and not being good enough. And then he uses all of these emotions of being not good enough to try to convince you that you can't take the next step in Christ or you can't do that thing God called you to or you can't be that thing God wants you to be or you can't operate in that ministry or operate in that calling or have that relationship or you can't do what it is God's calling you to do all because you convinced yourself you're not good enough. You know what good enough is? It's a lie from the devil to keep you from being who you are right now. The blood of Jesus made you good enough. Stop looking to everything else. Stop listening to everybody else's requirements and all of their junk. Do you, do you realize that when, when, when Peter began to preach Jesus, that 3,000 men accepted this message of Jesus Christ, were born again in a moment, and immediately began to speak and a spiritual gift to begin to speak in other tongues. They were saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and spoke in tongues in an instant. At what point did they get good enough? At what point did they keep all of the requirements and all the rules and walk out all the steps and take all the classes and go to all of the colleges? And At what point did they become good enough? The moment the blood of Jesus covered. And it's amazing to me that The blood of Jesus is continually coming and forgiving us of our sins when we ask and leading us into higher places in God. But yet we who are supposed to be the children of God are constantly trying to disqualify one another. If the blood is present, it's enough. The, the Old Testament, the, the, the schoolmaster, the lesson learner, the one that was supposed to open our eyes to see Christ when he come, what he was really doing. It said that you killed the lamb and you put the blood on the altar and that was sufficient. We add a whole bunch of other things trying to determine whether or not the blood is sufficient. And then we come to church and we sing the cross That's the final word. And we say amen and we shout and then we come up with all the other excuses why it's not the final word. We are so inconsistent because we're allowing the foot of emotion to regulate the mind rather than the righteousness and truth of Jesus Christ. The enemy comes and says, you don't feel good enough, so you're not good enough. And then you go... I guess I'm not good enough. I just don't feel it. When what you should have done was, get thee behind me, Satan. What God has called clean, let no man call unclean. And invoke the word of God to rebuke the lies of the devil. Nobody can fight that battle for you. Nobody can come and live in your head and force you to rebuke the lies of Satan. That's your job. That is the one thing nobody else can do for you. I can pray with you. I can give you scripture. You can call me on the phone when you're discouraged. And I can encourage you with the word. I can come to your house and pray for you. I can send you emails. I can do everything I physically can. But nobody can fight that battle but you. Look at your neighbor and say, it's you. 
And the problem is you have everything that you needed to win that battle. Everything you need to win that battle except the decision that I'm going to win this battle. So we go through hard things and life doesn't give us what we thought it should and people didn't treat us like we thought they should and things aren't going the way that we thought they should. And instead of going to the scriptures and finding out that Jesus said, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly and begin to declare and know in your heart that there's an abundance of life that God is pouring out to me and I'm not giving up, I'm not giving in, I'm not letting up, I'm not letting down, I'm holding fast to the cross of Jesus Christ because the abundant life is what he promised me. And instead of having that kind of tenacity, smile at me real big. We say, well, it's not fair. Fair? The whole concept of fair died at the cross. It wasn't fair for him to die for me. It wasn't fair that the only one who ever did it right had to die. So the one that at one point seemed like couldn't do anything right could live. No, it ain't fair. But man, it's glorious. Can you say amen? It's not fair. It's amazing. And then we look at the things that seem impossible and because we don't feel like we can do it and because we don't think we can do it and, and it hasn't been working the way that we had planned and it hadn't worked the way that we had thought, we start coming up with all of these lies from Satan about, well, I guess I'm never this and I guess I'm never that or I'm always this or I'm always that. Those are two words you should almost completely removed from your vocabulary. Because as soon as you tell God you're never going to do something, you're probably going to get challenged on that. And as soon as you determine I'm always going to do something, you'll fail. Right? But it's okay. Because it's God himself who's there to pick you up and to take you through and to take you on. Moses kills the Egyptian and then runs off in fear for his life to the backside of the desert. I, I love the way the King James says it. He didn't just go to the desert, man. He didn't just go out in the wilderness. He didn't, he didn't just go out there where nobody else was at. No, he went plumb to the backside of that. He got as far away as he could get. And I think that sometimes we see people who seem to be Christian. They seem to be living for God. They seem to make some good decisions. Maybe they even go to LCI or maybe they even go to Potter's and, and then all of a sudden they kind of wind up as far away as it seems like they can get. And it's really easy to just give up on that person. But the funny thing is about the backside of the desert is God went there too. You can never go so far away from God that he can't go there too. Well, now the Bible says if you're blaspheming against, you know, most people don't even understand what that means. You know what? You know what? To put it in the most simplest terms, to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is this. It's to reject the existence of God. You're saying God doesn't exist. I reject that whole concept. I've encountered him. I've heard his voice. I felt his presence and I'm rejecting it. And you know why that's unforgivable? Because if you don't believe in God, how are you going to ask Him for forgiveness? So what happens to the person who rejects God? Or at least they say some words that sound like rejection of God. And then down the road, they have this moment of clarity like the prodigal son that came to himself in the pig's pen. And they begin to pray and ask God for forgiveness. Maybe they hadn't actually done what you thought they'd done by their words. Maybe they were just having a bad moment, and in their heart, they never really gave up on God. You can't know that. Only one being in the entire universe gets to know that. His name is God. Quit trying to play God. And yet, in the middle of the wilderness, on the backside of the desert, he meets a man named Jethro's daughter. He falls for her. She falls for him. They get married. They have kids. Forty years. Forty years. I'm 42 years old. And some of you think I'm old. 
40 years he spent on the backside of the desert keeping the sheep of Jethro, married to this woman, having kids. After 40 years, he probably had decided, well, this is my life. But one day he's walking through the field and something up on the mountain catches his eye. And something in him is not satisfied to just keep on going day in, day out. I used to be royalty. Now I'm just out here dodging sheep droppings. I used to live in a palace and wear the best robes. And now sometimes I go a week without bathing. But about the time he accepts where life is, there's a flicker on top of the mountain. And he goes up there and he has an encounter. And at that encounter, there's, you could preach that entire encounter and it's been way longer than you guys want to be here this morning. But in that encounter, we see so many things. Number one, he finds out that there is purpose for his life other than dodging sheep droppings. On that mountain, he discovers that there is a God and he is holy and he is alive and he does interact with men and he is calling him to something else and he is sending him forth with promise and he's sending him forth with mission and he's sending him forth with power and his response is, well, I'm not very good at talking. I don't think I can do that. And that's when I realized, hey, he would fit right into church today. Moses could come right in. We wouldn't even recognize him. Because he has all of this calling and all of this power and all of this gifting, and yet he makes an excuse because he's not very good at talking. And I wonder how many of us are sitting here. The Spirit of God Himself dwells within you. There's no greater, more, more, more magnificent power and glory in the universe than the Spirit of God that dwells in you. With God, nothing is impossible. And yet we have our little, well, I don't speak very good. Well, I didn't go to school long enough. Well, I don't, I've never done that before. Is that got, got to be the dumbest excuse ever? Imagine, imagine men, the first time, you, you, maybe some of you really, 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 really dedicated men and I people, maybe it was at your, your, your wedding, I don't know. But I look back to the first time that my wife kissed me. And what, a, what an emotional moment that was. Can you imagine if she would have leaned in and I would have said, oh, I've never done that before. <laughs> can, can I be honest with you? That never entered my mind. Anybody? Is that too carnal for you? You'll get over it. But the first time God shows up to move, are you really going to say, well, I've never done that before? Well, then it's a good time to start. Can I get an amen? Amen. But I didn't think God was going to do it that way. Look at me real big, right? Ready? It doesn't really matter what you think. Your thinking is not what is going to get God to move. It's probably what's going to limit him if you don't surrender your thinking to him. Can you? Come on. Because we have plans, and that's great. I know you get all these teachings, and you read these 12-step books, and all of these things that tell you how to have a 10-year plan, and a 20-year plan, and how to work that plan, and you stick to that plan. The problem is, when your plan and God's plan don't line up, something's got to give, and it ain't going to be God. Oh, we go through those gut-wrenching, life-altering, terrible moments that, that just destroy the picture of what we thought life was going to be. And in that moment, you get to choose whether you're going to continue to hold on to that dead thing or whether you're going to give up, let go, and say, okay, God, if that's not what you had for me, then what do you have for me? And discovered the dream that God has that was bigger than your plans. Can you say amen? Stand to your feet with me. I'm going to try to close. Hey, I'm doing good on time this morning. Never mind, sit back. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Sometimes our dreams aren't conducive to God's plan. I said that backwards. Sometimes our plans aren't conducive to God's dreams. 
But when God brings His dream and you recognize it for what it is, all of a sudden our little plans, just, they just don't seem like that big a deal. When you really get a picture of the glory of what God wants to do in you, when you get that word, like when the prophet showed up and anointed David king, I just thought it was going to be a shepherd. It's no wonder, listen, it's no wonder why when they went out to fight, David was the one who was willing to fight. David was the one who had trusted God enough to kill the lion and the bear. David was the one that God showed up and said, I have a plan for your life, you're going to be king. So when this giant is sitting there and David's saying, well, God said I'm going to be king, so this giant can't stop me from being king. I must be king. God said I would be king. Do you have enough faith in God's promise to risk everything for it? I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I think that sometimes God puts us in a position where we have to be willing to risk everything to trust that what God said he was going to do he's going to do it and in that moment of trust it gives us the strength and the great courage to not do it the way everybody else does it but to hold fast to what God says to take that leap of faith to take that step and to watch God bring to pass the beauty of what he declared over our life I'd like you to just bow your heads for a moment. Would you close your eyes while she plays? The book of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, Jesus said, Think not I am come to send peace on the earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. Holy Spirit, I ask you to move right now in Jesus' name. Strip off all of the things, God, that we have laid in front of you and let us see clearly what you are speaking to us individually today. Lord, we, we take our plans and we just put them aside for the moment and say, God, nothing, nothing is off limits. Holy Spirit, speak right now. Speak to my relationships. Speak to my ministry. Speak to my parenting. Speak to my business. Speak to my finances. Speak to who I believe you are. Speak to who I think I am. Nothing is off limit, Lord. We, we come humbly to bear ourselves before you and say, God, look within us. Show us what you would have us to know today. If they've hurt us, if they've left us, if they've abandoned us, mistreated us, or talked bad about us, well, you know what? I just let that go right now. In Jesus' name, I forgive them. If they went out from us, then they were not of us. And that just means that God has something greater in store for us. If they didn't receive your word in ministry, that's okay. God has somebody else for you to minister to. Don't give up yet. If you had all your hopes and your dreams and your plans focused on something and that thing disappeared, guess what? That thing is not the center of your dreams. God is. If you're going through pain and suffering or, or affliction or woundedness and you've been believing God to heal you and He ain't healed you yet and now the enemy is coming and he's saying, well, maybe God doesn't do that or maybe God won't do that, I want to ask you something. Don't you know how much God loves you? He loves you too much not to fulfill His Word. He loves you too much to leave you like you are. Yes, His ways are beyond our ways. They're higher than our ways and beyond finding out. And we don't always understand the fullness of what God is doing. And sometimes God wants to accomplish some things in your situation before He takes you out of the situation. So I'm telling you, just be patient and believe the love of Jesus Christ. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father, which is in heaven, know how to give good gifts to you? Of course He's not going to leave you there. He's not going to leave you in that state of weariness and of longing and of hurting. He's the God that knows how to fill every void. He made the barren women to have children. He made an old man Abraham's body bring back youth. 
do you recognize that a 90-year-old woman was wanted by the king because she was so beautiful, God had restored something to her? Come on, somebody. If God can make a 90-year-old woman appealing to a king, you young ladies out there that think nobody wants you, that's a lie from the devil. He's trying to distract you so he can send the wrong one to you. You keep your eyes on Jesus and watch God bring the man of God into your life that will love you like the child of God that you are and be the man of God that he is called to be. Don't get in a hurry. Don't get anxious. Find God's dream this morning. You can trust in him. You can trust in him. Father, we thank you this morning for the kings that are in this congregation that don't even know they're anointed yet. Thank you for the priests and the prophets. Thank you for the, for the ministries that have not even been imagined yet, but before the foundation of the world was, you planted those gifts and you planted those callings. I believe right now in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit is beginning to, to reveal some things to hearts and minds in this room. Life has been struggling for some and you're tired of the fight and God says, just hold on a little bit longer. Your deliverance is on the way. Your freedom is just about to happen. The stone is about to be rolled away. The sun is about to come up. The light is about to shine. The glory of God is about to be manifest. Don't give up. Just listen for that call. Holy Spirit, we thank you this morning for calling light into our darkness, strength into our weakness, hope into our hopelessness. In Jesus' name, we receive you. And we declare right now we have all sufficiency in all things at all times. According to your word, it is in our life. I don't know what it looks like for you. I don't know what it feels like for you, but I know what the word of God says for you. And your ability to walk in that fullness is directly tied to your ability to hold on to that word. He has given you all sufficiency in all things at all times. Somebody just give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Receive from the Lord the fullness of what He's offered. I want to close, but I have a heaviness in my spirit. Not a bad heaviness. I feel an urge from the Holy Ghost. That if you're here this morning and your plans, your dreams, your, your hopes have fallen apart in front of your eyes, my heart goes out to you this morning. My heart breaks for you this morning as you sit in the pain and anxiety of life not being what you thought it would be. But please let me give you this word of hope, this word of truth, this word of life this morning. God is not done. Your life is not tied to the things that died and the things that fell away and the things that crumbled in front of you. God can call forth the dead things to live. He can call light to the middle of the void where there's nothing. He can bring hope and peace, love and joy, fulfillment and satisfaction and blessing. He can remove mountains at a word. He's not done with you yet. Hear me, child of God. The thing that died will never be as great as the thing God is bringing to you right now. Don't settle. Don't get anxious and run to a substitute and think, this is all I can have. God says, no, I don't make seconds. I have the fullness of what I have dreamed for you, says the Lord. I have the glory of all that I have planned. Don't settle for less than what I have for you. Please receive that this morning in Jesus' name. Let God stir your heart with faith, with hope, with great expectation, and with patience. The word, listen to me, the word patience means cheerful endurance. Stop walking around with your tongue dragging the ground because you just feel so sad. 
wash your face, fix your hair, brush the, br brush the dust off of you, and get ready to receive the fullness of the promise of God in your life. In Jesus' name, we receive that word this morning. Father, thank you. We give you all glory and all praise and all honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Celebrate the Lord this morning, would you? Just celebrate him. Celebrate him. Celebrate him. In the middle of Moses' identity crisis, when he didn't even know who he was, God used it. He used it to take him as far away as he could take him. And in his place of isolation, when he was all alone, that place nobody wants to be, that's when God revealed who he was. In those moments when you're all alone and you feel like you've been abandoned and you feel like there's nobody else that understands or knows or is going through what you're going through, lift your eyes, lift your hands, and begin to worship. Because those moments of isolation when you're all alone are some of the greatest moments of revelation. When you're desperate enough to look to Him and Him alone, that's when he shows up to be the greatest in your life that he's ever been. Can you say amen? He's not done. He's just beginning. And there's more to come. Hey, thanks for listening to this message. You can find more messages online at FusionBZ.com.